Hey everyone, good morning. My name is Kara Oosterhaus and I'm the Western Canadian Field Editor at Real Agriculture. I am pleased today to host today's webinar for the Simpson Centre for Agricultural and Food Innovation and Public Education at the School of Public Policy at the University of Calgary. I am a University of Calgary grad myself, so it is very excited to, exciting to be able to be back here to present to you guys. Um, Thank you very much for joining us. It is, like I said, great to have you all here. We wouldn't be able to do these things without you guys. So we appreciate your participation. You'll have an opportunity at the end to put your questions. Um, you, you can put them in at any point, actually. Just put them in the question box below where it says uh, Q&A and we will get to them right after Jared has done his presentation. It will be another exciting presentation today. So please be sure to submit your questions. Uh, Jared is happy to happy to get to them however we can. So we, today we have a sneak peek of a soon to be published paper by Dr. Jared Carlberg. Um, as I said, you may ask your questions in the Q&A box below. So please keep that in mind. To give you a little sneak peek on Dr. Carlberg, uh, he is a professor of agribusiness and agriculture economics at the University of Manitoba. His main research focuses upon issues in agricultural marketing, especially cattle and beef pricing and supply chains, but he also has an interest in the economics of food and nutrition, especially as they relate to the public cost of food related chronic diseases. Dr. Carlberg was raised on a family farm at Osage, Saskatchewan and completed undergraduate degrees in both finance and economics, as well as a master's degree in agricultural economics at the University of Saskatchewan before receiving his doctorate in agricultural economics from Oklahoma State University in 2002. So Dr. Carlberg has quite a lineup of education here, some knowledge. I am very much looking forward to his presentation. I know I have a couple questions and I'm sure you guys will as well. So uh, please feel free to submit them. And Jared, I will let you jump in from here. Thank you very much, Kara. And thank you to the Simpson Center for inviting me to first of all, carry out uh, this paper and present this talk today. So you can see the title hopefully of, of my paper up there on the screen, just by way a little bit of background, as Kara noted, I'm a farm kid from Osage, Saskatchewan, uh, now working in the Department of Agribusiness and Agricultural Economics at the University of Manitoba. I have a longstanding interest in primary agricultural industries in Western Canada and issues and so again, it is a delight to be speaking on this topic today. I was approached to do a paper by the Simpson Center uh, early this spring. And so a large part of the work that I've done on this was carried out back in June. Of course, we now have about five months extra knowledge about COVID-19, the way it works, the things that uh, have happened as a result of it. So a lot of uh, what's in the paper is, uh, is a little bit uh, focused on that initial period. At the time the paper was written, we were about three months in, and so uh, we have more knowledge, more ability to adapt, and a uh, greater amount of tools at our disposal today. Nevertheless, you see that the title of the paper pertains to agri-food processing facilities in the age of COVID-19, where we still are and will remain for some time, I suspect, and it's a case study of the beef processing sector in Canada. Next slide, please. So just a little bit of a background, as we all know, this epidemic began uh, in early 2020, although a lot of information that's out there suggesting probably we, uh, we had COVID-19 in North America as early as uh, last fall, probably in November or so. So the paper itself focuses on what the vulnerabilities and benefits of, uh, of COVID-19 are to the uh, large scale agro-processing sector in Canada, particularly in the beef industry. We can extend a lot of the conclusions and a lot of the discussion, a lot of the ideas to the broader agri-food sector. As, uh, as uh, food production has needed to increase to accommodate a growing population, so has the scale of agri-food production, just as it has uh, the scale of, of uh, on-farm production has increased a great deal. When we have this kind of large scale uh, processing and production going on, disruptions to food supply chains can occur and can be quite detrimental to not only farm income and agri-processor income, but also the farm sector in general and to food security overall. 
in this paper, so when I was approached to do this paper by the Simpson Center, basically the idea was talk about the issue a little bit, come up with some options. So discuss uh, what the possible effects of, of disease outbreaks like COVID-19 would be, come up with some options about how we could move forward. So the paper was really posed as an options paper. So we're gonna talk about at the, at the we're gonna go through a, a lot of background in the paper, a discussion of some of the relevant issues, and then really get to the point where we say, what if anything can be done about this? Because even after we get COVID-19 under control, we're starting to see some, uh, even though it's, it's a very uh, difficult time, of course, with case numbers expanding, almost everywhere. We, we did see some bright news this week with uh, prospective vaccine by Pfizer, of course, uh, on, the, on the horizon. But even if, once we get this under control, there will be future disease outbreaks. We all hope that's not for a very long time. But as the world gets smaller and, and uh, we have more and more people traveling, more and more types of markets that are opening up, it, it's certainly not out of the realm of possibility that this could happen again. So part of what we wanna do is come up with strategies to prevent similar really disastrous uh, outcomes in the future. So again, focus on this paper is upon livestock, the cattle and beef industries, the one with which I probably have uh, the most familiarity. Next slide, please. So as we learned this spring and summer, uh, disease outbreaks certainly were not limited to the general public and started to occur in facilities throughout North America. And again, would have happened in many, across many industries and across many different subsectors within agri-food industries, but I'm focusing on the red meat industry and specifically beef here. So we could spend quite a bit of time talking about the plant closures or idlings or output reductions that occurred in North America, but I'm really focusing on Canada in my paper. So there's a fairly long list, certainly by just identifying the companies that are listed on this, uh, on this slide, it's not suggesting these were the only companies or that they did anything wrong or that uh, you know, they're at fault for, for anything. These are, are merely uh, instances of, of plant closures or slowdowns that were noted in the media. So the Cargill, Ready, uh, Cargill Case Ready plant in Calgary um, not too long ago, uh, JBS, so formerly Lakeside Packers, of course, in Brooks, Alberta earlier this year, uh, Cargill at High River in the spring of 2020. And then uh, according to media sources, at least uh, at least three outbreaks at the Harmony Beef plant in Balzac uh, that have, have, have unfortunately occurred throughout much of 2020. Next slide, please. So what happens? What are the significant implications of uh, these outbreaks? Of course, food security is, is one of the most important ones. So disruptions to supply chains for these important protein sources can affect can Canadian public health, certainly well-being. Uh, the public health itself, so a lack of food security is not only a mental health issue, but a physical health issue. Public health itself, um, we've seen many cases where outbreaks that occurred at plants were then taken home into the community. So again, just based on media accounts that I've read, so 950 out of 2000 employees at a large Canadian beef packing plant tested positive and then took that home into the community different ways and, and ended up with, uh, again, by, by the media source that, that I'm citing, uh, 1,560 cases connected to that outbreak. So we see that it's a pretty significant uh, effect, which everybody knows, I'm not telling you anything new here. Next slide, please. So what are these so-called mega-scale agro-processing facilities? So mega-scale, just some wording used, uh, again, in the Simpson Center's call for papers on, on this topic. So mega-scale, uh, somewhat politically charged terminology. It's not necessarily wrong. Mega-scale, large-scale. I'll use those interchangeably throughout my presentation as I do throughout my paper. And it just acknowledges the fact that things are much larger in scale in terms of agri-food processing that they have been at any other point throughout, uh, throughout history. But a couple of, of real significant factors have driven things in that direction, in my opinion. The first one is efficiency considerations. So economies of scale lead to fixed costs being spread out over more units of production as plant size increases. This is sort of why we end up with monopolies, natural monopolies or monopolies in things like the provision of electricity or water or things like that. So the idea of uh, economies of scale really just means that as a plant gets bigger, 
you can spread out fixed costs of production across more produced units, which increases, reduces costs, and as a result, increases profits. So that is something that has really driven the trend towards larger scale agri-food processing. Secondly, the desire for enhanced food security. So people who are interested in food security will probably question this a little bit, or at least it might seem counterintuitive to them. But the desire for enhanced food security is actually supported by larger scale because in making, like we all would, would probably argue that, hey, wait a minute, you're saying that having larger scale reduces costs and probably whoever owns the plant is just gonna claim all of those costs, all of those savings or economic rents as we economists might call them. But the fact is, if we have even anything toward a, a competitive outcome, then we would say that as cost decrease, so does price if price equals marginal cost. So larger scale facilities could in fact enhance food security by allowing food to be produced at a lower price. So these are just a couple of the factors that have driven the trend toward larger scale uh, agri-food processing facilities. Next slide, please. There's also regulatory factors that have kind of led to this drive toward bigger is better. So each of the levels of three levels of government, so as we all know, there's municipal, provincial, federal governments, they all have the ability to use policy tools to attract investment. Why do they want to attract investment? Usually they want to provide a better set of economic circumstances for their constituents and attract largely by attracting employment to the area, providing jobs to the people that they serve. The overall idea is, is Additionally, as employment increases, if we can bring new people into the area and make life better, provide more income for the people who are in the area, then other industries that uh, will, be, will be attracted as well as a result of that. Next slide, please. So what can we do to attract investment? Again, tying this together a little bit. Well, what has driven the trend towards larger scale processing facilities? Kind of the focus of what I'm talking about today. So, so we're, we're Back on the ranch here, remember, we're discussing a situation where we have disease outbreak. Um, why, why is a disease outbreak important in the agri-food sector, perhaps potentially in the red meat packing sector? Well, because we have large scale facilities where a lot of people can get sick because there's a lot of people working at these places. And so that's why we're having this discussion of what is leading to the larger scale facilities and why governments might be tempted to attract them and have them constructed in their jurisdictions. So what do governments do to attract the investment that is typically needed to, to support these, these large scale facilities? Well, they can grant tax incentives, tax reductions, holidays or waivers, particularly in the area of, of property taxes, not always limited to property taxes provide provision of, of infrastructure or upgrades to existing infrastructure, things like water and waste treatment obviously would be very important for something like a, a beef packing plant. Uh, transportation infrastructure could be better rail lines, better roads, better highways and utilities, of course. Things like uh, having a more streamlined uh, business friendly investment environment could be ease of tax filing or paperwork for getting permits to say add to a plant or upgrade something, things like that. Lastly, loans and loan guarantees to reduce the risk of investment for people that might be bringing these uh, larger scale facilities into an area. Next slide, please. So there's vulnerabilities associated with these as well. Uh, uh, what makes these a larger scale facilities? So again, just reiterating that the goal of the, of the research that I've undertaken really was to look at the role of what was have been termed uh, mega scale agri food processing facilities in times of disease outbreaks such as this. So what makes this type of facility facility particularly vulnerable to outbreaks of diseases like COVID-19? Well, close proximity of workers to one another. This happens more in less mechanized subsectors like beef and pork within the animal protein subsector of the agri food sector more broadly. So less mechanized sectors require more human work and more humans to be working in close contact with one another compared to say more mechanized sectors, which a, a lot of observers would argue chicken processing could be an example, chicken or turkey. They're high touch environments. Lots of, could be lots of tools being used, could be lots of common areas where things are being touched, could be lots of keypads being used. Things where really uh, you create an environment where the ease of uh, disease transmission is a little bit easier than, than we would consider ideal. 
people coming together in common areas. So every every shift hopefully has uh, has breaks associated with it for meals, for coffee, and uh, it's typical for workers who are working long hours and difficult jobs to want some social interaction during their breaks. Of course, that social interaction in turn provides conditions for disease spread. And also common handling of uh, both products that are in process and finished products. So it's clear to see that there are conditions associated with large scale plants and to some extent, uh, any plant that would lead to, could lead to disease uh, spread. Next slide, please. So what are our options? As I said at the outset of the presentation today, we're looking at things that could be done differently and we think outside the box. So some of what I'm going to talk about, a lot of observers will say, oh, that sounds interesting. That could work. And most people might say about something else that'll never work. So the idea uh, was just to do a little bit of brainstorming. I didn't want to come up with a huge list of options and spend a bunch of time going over them. So I really focused on, on a small number. So we, we kind of understand that the system, the air quote system has evolved the way that it has as a result of some pretty strong forces. So Adam Smith spoke about an invisible hand that was driving resources to their highest value use. And many economists I think would argue that the invisible hand, it's a, it's a simplistic way of uh, representing the set of economic forces that kind of have led to the environment where we have these larger scale facilities. The question is, of course, what, if anything, should, uh, should or can be done about it? Next slide, please. So it was in the theory of moral sentiments that uh, Adam Smith uh, mentioned this. <clears throat> I've, I've talked about this a little bit already. So we can move to the next slide, please. So if we do believe that change is possible or desirable or worth pursuing, there are some options available. Probably a lot. Everybody, uh, I see 36 participants uh, on the call, something like that. Everybody probably has uh, a number of good ideas, many of which would be better than mine as to what uh, could be done. So I've tried to distill all the brainstorming that I did down into some things that just based on my history as an agricultural economist in Canada and the US for, I don't know, 25 years or more, I guess, going back to my graduate school days that, that you know, we're just providing some food for thought. So we'll go over each of these in turn. But my thoughts were encouraging the development of smaller scale facilities is an option. If we think that there's a lot of large scale facilities, yes, we understand that economic forces have driven them toward that kind of scale for perfectly natural reasons. But if we had fewer people working in smaller facilities, we probably have more people working overall, but fewer people in any given facility. So if a disease outbreak were to strike, any particular facility, it would mean there would be fewer people in theory, at least, affected in any given facility. So that's something that could happen, that, that could work. It's an idea. The second thing I came up with was the possibility that encouraging alternative ownership structures could be done. Talk a little bit about that. And that's something I've been studying, uh, again, for a very long time, going back to my time as a PhD student at Oklahoma State University. And then thirdly, the third option to make the existing plants that we have less susceptible to disease spread. Next slide, please. So starting at the beginning, the first thing that, uh, that I came up with was as a potential option for this to mitigate the impacts of disease spread in very large scale facilities. Well, one thing I guess we could do is encourage the development of smaller scale facilities. This has been something the cattle industry's been trying to do, or, or some within the industry and the agri-food sector have been trying to do for almost as long as I can remember. It's been, it's been difficult to achieve in most cases. So I'm going to talk about some of, my, some of my work in new generation cooperatives from when I was a graduate student in a few slides, but I know that there are some pretty nice success stories for the encouragement of smaller scale processing facilities, mostly in the United States and the Northern Plains. And it, but it's been difficult. I've, I've seen lots of these things kind of try to start up, not just in beef and pork processing, but in a lot of subsectors over the years. And it's been, it's been tough going. I think, I think they're noble efforts. I think there've been some very well-intentioned people involved with this, I think as somebody who is a farm kid who believes deeply in, uh, in the economic success of, of the rural sector and rural areas, it's been difficult for me to observe uh, how, how, hard, 
how hard it's been to, to generate better economic development in rural areas. But this is something that has been suggested a lot over time. Some observers are concerned that only that 75% of federally inspected beef processing capacity is located in Alberta. So I have no particular issue with that, but I know that uh, a lot of people raise an eyebrow over that. Uh, they have 40% of the cow calf herd in, in Alberta province that I have uh, traveled to many times, always enjoyed, always respected, always even admired actually, and uh, really an Alberta fan. So it's, it's not me saying anything negative about it, merely an observation that some people have said having nearly twice the processing capacity compared to the cattle herd is, uh, is uh, something that, that they have questioned over the years. Just three plants in Canada have around 80% of the federally inspected beef processing capacity. So we focus in this paper, I talk a little bit about federally inspected beef processing capacity. Of course, there are a lot, uh, many more provincially inspected beef processing or, or cattle, multi-species in some case processing facilities. The only difference is for federally inspected, you get to do more things in terms of where your uh, products can go internationally and even across provincial borders compared to the other class of plants. So even though I focus mostly on federally inspected facilities, it certainly is not the entire picture for uh, the total facilities that are out there. So aside from the, the disease spread issues in very large scale plants, there are long standing questions about the impacts upon competitiveness. So one of the areas that I've done the most probably technical economics in in my career going back to my days as a PhD student was on actually trying to assess the degree of comp competitiveness in the beef packing industry, uh, both in Canada and the United States. And there have been over the years for firm concentration ratios that have you know, clearly exceeded 80%, which is kind of thought of as a threshold for anti-competitive behavior. Nevertheless, repeated empirical studies have uh, had a lot of difficulty turning up any actual anti-competitive behavior in that sector. So again, not making any kind of an allegation, just the observation that uh, people in the industry and industry observers have raised these questions over the years. Next slide, please. So st still going with, thank you very much for backing that up. Uh, still going with the, the first potential option, so encouraging development of smaller scale facilities. Uh, the cost and benefit of this are pretty complex. So how exactly would this work? So we've said, okay, there are a few large facilities. What if we somehow mandated or encouraged or invested in or subsidized the uh, construction of safe federally inspected facilities or new facilities of whatever level of inspection that were more geographically dispersed, perhaps more closely associated with the actual distribution of the cow calf herd and, and good observers would, would note that, yeah, you could talk about the cow calf herd, but where's the cattle feeding industry, of course, still largely concentrated obviously in the same areas where, uh, you know, where the plants are. So I guess the counter argument to that would be, well, if you, if you had more plants, then, uh, then uh, you would perhaps attract feeding industries where the plants were. And again, that, that's something that is so unwieldy as to potentially be unworkable, but what we're doing here is just considering options. So it's an option. So the new facilities ideally could have a higher degree of, of mechanization, which of course would lead to fewer people, uh, which may not even be a great thing because yeah, people spread disease, but they also pay taxes. And so having employment creation is, is, is a clear goal of most rural policy that I know of. Yeah, you might get enhanced regional economic development in some areas, but uh, where would the cattle come from if they're already going to these very large scale plants that probably aren't going anywhere as a result, uh, just because you start up some new plants. There could be new ancillary industries around these new plants. Um, however, we've said that the reason we have relatively cheap food is because we've become a lot better at producing and processing it in these large scale farms, large scale facilities. And so what happens to those economies of scale? Like are people gonna tolerate food prices increasing as we go to less efficient production means? It's a fair question for sure. And uh, I think most of us probably will be somewhat vaguely aware that uh, public budgets are likely to be in significant dis uh, distress for, for many years, if not decades or even generations to come as a result of COVID-19 and the budgetary expenditures, especially in Canada, from our senior levels of government that, that COVID-19 has required. 
And so would there be any money left in order to support the development of say smaller scale facilities? So there's some pros, there's some cons, there's certainly challenges, but it's just an idea. Next slide, please. Second idea that kind of uh, I thought about a little bit was encouraging alternative ownership, structure, ownership structures. This isn't completely different from the first strategy that we just got done discussing. In fact, it could be closely linked with it. So one of the areas that I did research in when I was a graduate student was on new generation cooperatives. Around the time I was a graduate student, which was in right around the turn of the century. So I graduated in 2002 from Oklahoma State and new generation cooperatives were really popular in the Northern States. So basically farmer owned processing cooperatives where farmers would invest, they would provide the raw products to be processed and uh, thus uh, you know, claim ownership over whatever profits or rents were generated. And it was a really good idea in theory. And it really worked in a really small number of cases really well. So it didn't always work. Uh, they were really popular in, in areas like ethanol production because at 15 million gallons per year production or 12 million, maybe it was a million gallon, gallons a month, all of a sudden some pretty good subsidies kicked in for ethanol production, which made it profitable. But there were also, there were other, you know, really big name success stories. Uh, there's American Crystal Sugar Company, Dakota Grower, Dakota Growers passed the company, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Notably absent in the list of success stories are any plants or co-ops that I could, could find that really had much to do with, with meat processing, although there were a few attempts to do that. So this is just an idea. So we said on the previous slide, hey, if we wanna come up with some smaller scale production, great, might work, might uh, reduce disease spread because the, you know, if we have fewer people working in a given plant and the plant gets infected, then we have lower le levels of disease spread among employees, less transmission to the community, et cetera, sounds good. But, uh, but in terms of, of scale, that would be, that, that could be, difficult in terms of the economic, uh, the less, less economic incentive for, for that smaller scale. But new generation cooperatives or some similar type of smaller scale agriculture or farmer owned processing facility is one idea that could be encouraged too. So that's a little bit tied to the first idea that I had in terms of encouragement of smaller scale. It's not necessarily the case, I guess, that these alternative ownership structures be small in scale. There are some very, very large successful new generation cooperatives from around the turn of the century again when I was studying this issue. So it could happen. The idea here is that the farmer or, or rancher ownership of processing could enable producers again to capture more of the downstream rents. So we could kind of kill two birds with one stone as the saying goes. We would have smaller scale facilities perhaps being started up which would limit disease spread, be at least from a disease spread perspective, less risky, although economically probably a bit more risky. And we'd also perhaps be doing some rural economic development, which as I've said, it's, is always something I'm interested in. Unfortunately, the evidence uh, suggests that you have to be really good at this in order for it to work. There's not a lot of those new generation co-ops from the US uh, in around the turn of the century, late 90s, early 2000s that are still around. But there are some notable success stories. So it is something that's a possibility. Next slide, please. The third option that I came up with and probably the one where uh, we have the most realistic opportunity of accomplishing this is to improve existing facilities. So again, uh, my thinking on this was largely in the spring of this year, about five months ago, a lot has happened since then. So that was less than halfway into what we might now call the, the COVID-19 experience from day one, wherever it was. And I kind of think of day one as around, you know, late March or so when people were, were maybe mid-March when we were just starting to get the understanding that, hey, yeah, we've heard of this disease. It's kind of over in other parts of the world. And now we're talking about we have to limit our gatherings and politicians kind of seem to be getting a little bit nervous about it and the media is talking about it a lot that kind of was middle of March so if we think of middle of March as kind of day one where it was really in the public consciousness in a significant way to today is around I guess the 12th of November so that's several months my thinking on this was kind of taking place fairly early uh, after day one so in that in that kind of May maybe first part of June period 
So at that time, there wasn't a lot of talk yet about the types of measures that almost all of society has embraced in order to help us deal with this and let us still go to the grocery store and let us still go to the hardware store and the other places, the doctor's office, the places that are deemed uh, essential. So um, a lot of these improvements, we now have much more familiarity with. The point is, a lot of the improvements we now have a lot more familiarity with than we did in the earliest days of COVID, which makes me more confident even that improving existing facilities is probably the best bet that we have and, and where things have gone and will go. So these large scale plants probably aren't going anywhere, but we all agree that conditions have to be improved to most importantly protect the safety of the workers and their families, but also continue to provide a safe, secure food supply to Canadians. So food security is a big part of this, of course. So things, and a lot of these have been put in place recently at different types of establishments, uh, temperature checks for employees, frequent wipe downs of common tools, keypads, et cetera, a provision of high quality masks. So some of the uh, media accounts that you read about disease, disease outbreaks at various plants early on are heartbreaking. There was no provision of safety equipment. There was no understanding of the type of safety equipment that might be needed or required or effective for that matter. So again, not to insinuate fault on anyone's part, but just if we only knew then what we knew now, we, we could have saved lives then and, and protected the health of workers and the public to a little, uh, to a little better extent. Uh, plastic screens between employees where feasible and increased mechanization as well. So some of the things that I think are being done, can be done, should be done, will be done, because again, uh, even if one or both of the previous ideas that I've put forth today come to pass. These are things that need to be done uh, at existing facilities. Next slide, please. So in summary, just a uh, just saying again, so when I was when I was approached to sorry, just doing some uh, on screen paperwork with the moderator down here or the organizer. <clears throat> when I was first approached to uh, potentially write an options paper, what was termed an options paper on this. I was asked, uh, tell us about the problem, discuss the, the vulnerabilities and benefits to the sector, to the public uh, of these large scale or what they termed mega scale agri-food processing facilities. Come up with some options of, of things you think are interesting and could be done even if they may not work. We want to know what you think about it. That's what I've tried to do. So these large scale or mega scale agro-processing facilities are vulnerable to disease outbreaks due to the prevalence of large numbers of workers in close proximity. So ideal conditions for disease spread. Um, they exist for a reason. So people like cheap things and cheap food so we can spend our money on things that are kind of more enjoyable, although almost without exception, less necessary than food. But people like cheap food. And so we've built bigger and bigger plants to produce cheaper and cheaper food. And so, these these scale these large scale facilities have come about as a result of natural economic forces. However, they have created a set of conditions which is more ideal probably for disease spread than in the so-called olden days. And COVID-19 in particular has really impacted uh, food security across the world, even in Canada. It's impacted the cattle and beef industry through plant closures and it's created huge amounts of stress for all of us involved in how this would be effectively dealt with. And this threatens the food security of consumers. Next slide, please. So I mentioned the three options. I won't spend a lot of time going over them as I know I've taken a little bit longer than we probably planned uh, to go through this. And I do that every single time and do it next time too, my apologies. So we could have a system of smaller scale facilities, could be probably expensive. Uh, this has been a dream of most agri processing sectors for a long time, at least from a farmer standpoint. Uh, we could have try some alternative ownership structures. So I have quite a bit of familiarity with new generation cooperatives. Some of them worked, a lot of them didn't. Is this, is this enough of a once in a century event to maybe generate some more interest in that, in that organizational structure? Probably where we end up though is just improvements to existing plants to better protect workers and better 
protect the food security of Canadians. Next slide, please. So that's it for me. Back to Kara. Awesome. Thank you very much, Jared. We, uh, that was a very interesting presentation. Uh, we definitely have a few questions in here, so uh, we'll tackle those right away. Um, the first question here has to deal with large scale processing. Now, it's, the question is large scale processing sometimes gets painted with an unsustainable brush, not being green nor kind to animals. Is there an argument that smaller scale processing is somehow better for the environment or animal welfare or are handling methods exactly the same? I can't speak to whether handling methods are exactly the same. My guess is that whatever animal welfare laws exist apply equally regardless of the scale of the enterprise, but that may not be true. There sometimes are special exemptions in special cases. I think that, uh, that concerns of, of consumers or observers who have issue with the sustainability practices of whatever scale of enterprises are certainly within uh, their, their right to do so. And I encourage and applaud us all to behave in the most, uh, including large and small scale processors alike to behave in the most environmentally sensitive ways uh, that we can that are reasonable and, and allow us to still process food and provide employment to Canadians who need it. Absolutely. So next question here, have meat processing facilities in Alberta adopted application based COVID tracking measures? Local companies such as Provision Analytics has developed an app that could help companies, but it appears that companies prefer to use their own tracking measures. Do you have any comments on that? I, I have no knowledge of what those plant specific procedures might be. And I certainly encourage uh, that firm to be in touch. Um, certainly uh, a company like Cargill uh, is probably uh, very capable of carrying out the tasks that need to be done and that make it compliant with regulations, but always uh, very, very pleased to see new innovation happening on those fronts and, and certainly supportive of Alberta companies uh, continuing to innovate in that regard. So another one here, it says on the biggest, one of the biggest challenges I hear is in relation to licensed inspectors, scheduling and availability. In order for the first two options to be viable, there would be first need to be a commitment that increased processing capacity, and it would be met with an increase in licensed inspectors. How would that commitment be able to be made and sustained? That's a phenomenal question. Excellent, great thinking by whoever asked it. Um, Great question. I don't know the answer to that. I think you're absolutely right, though, the, the availability of inspectors. Hopefully, uh, we could get public dollars for training as part of an overall strategy to support uh, one or both of those two, uh, one of or both of those two options. Should those be options that are palatable to the industry and to, to farmers and ranchers? But that's a very good question and one of uh, a large number of challenges that would face the establishment of, uh, of, of new smaller scale facilities, but that's very good thinking by the questioner. Thank you. So um, shifting over to NGCs a bit, uh, what were the challenges and barriers and reasons that NGCs did not survive? Well, one of the reasons, as I understand it, so there's some good, someone wants to drop me an email and, and ask for it. Uh, there, there's a good paper that it takes a very retrospective look at NGCs published only a few years ago. It looks back at the history of them and it comes out of, I believe it was the co-op chair at North Dakota State University. I think one of the arguments is, is scale. So you have trying to most, so we live in a, in a, one of the world's largest and most successful agricultural areas in the North American plains. We go grow crops that are crops and raise livestock that are, are very common, well known. And so jumping in as a typically pretty small scale uh, processor to compete with typically very large scale worldwide uh, mega billion dollar, trillion dollar companies like say Cargill, if you were to get into beef packing is pretty tough. So I think there, there are a lot of issues, but again, one of the them was the competitiveness of the processing sectors into which many NGCs were trying to compete. Uh, also, the uh, in general, in the US, even raising money wasn't a really big problem. They tended to be 
well capitalized, at least at startup. But I would say just the competitiveness of the industries into which they were entering was probably the most important part. One of the papers I wrote uh, some time ago, which has been cited quite a number of times over the years, even recently, was on success factors for new generation cooperatives, which we ascertained by just talking to uh, or surveying the managers of, uh, of 50 some NGCs that had started up in the state. So that's also some further reading for people who are interested, but it just was difficult to start up inst processing competitors at a relatively limited scale in um, in some of these industries. So that's a little bit longer answer than you probably wanted, but thank you for the question. Absolutely. Um, when cattle futures dipped below 93 cents in June and July, retail prices did not change. The mega plants inputs were clearly substantially lower. Um, so who made the abnormal profits, the mega plant or the retail stores? It's not, i.e. not clear pricing mega plant to retail store. So yeah, you're, you're preaching to the choir here as a practicing economist um, who grew up on a cattle farm in Saskatchewan I've, I've, and, and still has you know, a family in, in cattle production in Southeast Saskatchewan at Carniff actually, my family, my in-laws. Uh, we've, we've known for some time or we've, we've thought for some time, it's been the subject of really extensive debate, thought, and even empirical analysis for decades that you know, there's, there's anti-competitive behavior happening in beef packing. Um, but again, uh, there has been very little empirical evidence that that's the case. Um, I recall having, having been uh, consulted on, by the government of Canada on the acquisition of better beef by Cargill in about, I guess it was 2005. And a uh, lot of very extensive study that I and others did into that prospective merger that then was allowed to go forth by the Competition Bureau. So there's a line from a movie that goes, it's not what you know, it's what you can prove. And so until there is empirical evidence um, that is clearly showing some kind of anti-competitive behavior or abnormal profit taking or whatever, it's, 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 it's a difficult road to try to suggest or change that change the behavior that you think might be happening. So I think that's a pretty good question. I think it's a very fair question to ask if the price of cattle goes down, how come the price of beef doesn't go down? That's a good question. I don't have the answer and I'm not suggesting any improper behavior on the part of either retailers or beef packers. I just think it's a really good question. And lots of us also ask, you know, how come the price of gas goes up every long weekend and uh, they're kind of related and also in that industry, there's been very little empirical evidence presented of any kind of anti-competitive behavior. So there's a big, long non-answer for you. Still an answer for sure. And like you said, whether we have answers or not, I think it's important to discuss the things that we maybe don't necessarily have answers to either. So another question here is, if we consider government funding and support of smaller scale facilities, could they be considered as infrastructure investments like the province is doing now, but would not only provide short term immediate jobs, but would provide longer term jobs? Would this be a reasonable infrastructure expenditure or would it need positive ROI and competitive profits for the longer term? That's another great question. So the people watching today are doing a really, really good job. I like the line of thinking there. I agree completely that it would be appropriate when we think back to, you know, the original New Deal, not the Green New Deal that's been the subject of a lot of uh, debate recently in the US. But uh, coming out of some of the worst times in history when we needed to spur economic development, we, we spent money on infrastructure, new things. I certainly think that that type of enterprise would, would be uh, could be, and I'm, I'm not even going to say specific to small beef packing facilities, but just, yeah, there's, there's going to be a need for economic activity. Uh, recently, I was uh, traveled to Minneapolis, and I've never seen so much road work in my life, and I'm pretty sure that part of what's going on there is we're just trying to get people out working, and, uh, and I think that, that I certainly, if I was a policymaker, I'm not, I certainly would be uh, making that calculation of what debt levels could be carried and how to use new debt to try to get spur economic activity and especially get Albertans or Manitobans and all Canadians uh, back to work. So I like the line of thinking and I think my answer to your question is yes, that's probably a good way to go. 
And this question is going back a bit from uh, the start of your presentation. Um, this question says, I see chicken is more mechanized than beef and pork processing. How fast do you foresee this continuing to change? And why do you think chicken has moved more into mechanization first? Without being so, I'm in the unique and I'm not sure enviable or unenviable position of having processed chickens, pork, beef, geese, um, everything on my farm when I was a kid. So as a five-year-old lopping the head off of, uh, <laughs> it wasn't, trust me, it wasn't a particularly mechanized process at that time. Although my grandpa did build a, a, a chicken plucker. But um, so, so I'm not familiar with the modern workings of, of chicken or turkey facilities compared to, compared to beef and pork. My guess is that as the carcass size gets smaller, and, and less unwieldy to move around a plant or handle, you probably can have a higher degree of mechanization. But I could be missing something there. So I, I think that, that as we discussed the, the, the notion of Adam Smith's invisible hand that was driving resource use to its highest value, I think the profit motive really acts in that way uh, in capitalized capitalistic societies like ours. And I think that efficiency considerations will have firms looking for increased levels of mechanization to the best of their abilities as we move forward. Although perhaps now there will be a little bit more of a uh, public health motive to that as well. But I do think that economics incentives will continue to drive in that direction. Another one here says, uh, are the safety actions at large processing plants legislated or are they just best practices recommended recommendations at this point? Why are we still seeing some outbreaks at some of these plants? Is is the I question. think that's a pretty I think that's a pretty good question. Sorry, Carrie, to interrupt the end of your statement there. I think that's a really good question, and I think the answer is both. So there certainly are are uh, labor standards that are out there that require particular um, safety measures to be in place, and that's been one of the largest uh, contributions of the unionized labor movement since the industrial revolution. And I think too that there are companies out there that are, they're just good companies. There are places that pay more attention. So we all know from human resource uh, studies that the largest cost, largest human resource related costs, or I shouldn't say the largest, it's probably not true, but a very significant uh, human resource cost is turnover. And so plants and firms generally would like to keep the people, keep their people working. They'd like to keep them healthy. They'd like to keep them safe. They'd like to keep them productive. They'd like to keep them happy. And so my guess is that there are companies out there that do a lot more than the minimum, although I can't speak to at any particular plant or in any particular industry or for any particular firm as to the extent to which it's like a 80-20 split between what I have to do and what I've chosen to do. But that's a pretty good question. That's a pretty good question. And my hope is that in the beef packing industry in Canada and elsewhere, that it is those uh, those worker health considerations that do lead to most of the positive things that companies will be doing, or certainly will in the future, as as companies recognize, continue to recognize that what we're trying to do is have a healthy, safe workforce and uh, and protect our employees. So we have time for one last question here, um, and it's a follow up to the government infrastructure investment comment. So would investment for plants fit for purpose to exploit export opportunities versus domestic supply be appropriate in either beef or if you can comment pork? Uh, I, I can't probably comment any more credibly on pork than I can on beef. Uh, but but I, to me, the important part is to spur economic activity. We all know that red meat in Canada is, is its supply far outstrips its demand. And so it would seem to me to be inevitable that you would, it, you would be certainly investing, and I think that is an appropriate term to use, for products that would be destined for export. It would be great if uh, our population can, continues to grow and we consume more of those products domestically, but uh, I'm more concerned about the job creation and economic activity part of it, and of course, limiting disease spread. But so I do think it's an appropriate uh, to term it investment. I think it's inevitable that many of those products would be exported because we, we need a lot less food than we produce. And I have no problem with that, nor do I think it would be inappropriate for those products to be exported. I could be wrong. <laughs> 
Um, well, unfortunately, that is all the time we have. Uh, sorry to those of you that we did not get to your questions. It uh, We appreciate all the interaction and I know Dr. Karlberg and enjoys it and appreciates it as well. So uh, thank you, Jared, for sharing your insight today. And thank you for everyone that tuned in. This is a very important topic. And it's really important to get different perspectives always on what is going on in the world. So please keep your eye on, an, on your inbox for a follow up email. Uh, that's where this webinar will be posted if you didn't get a chance to watch the whole thing. And if you haven't registered to join us in on November 26, uh, which is, I believe, next week, uh, please do. We'll be welcoming Robert Falconer discussing temporary foreign workers and their role in Canadian agriculture. So thanks again, everyone. And I look forward to chatting with you guys next time.